up doing is we're going to talk first about you. We're going to talk about your journey. You're going to end up sharing who you are, what you do, how you serve people. And we're going to learn about your journey and, and the struggles that you overcame to be able to do what you do. I believe that getting to know the person and their journey behind the business that they run and how they serve their clients is the best way to inspire others to keep that internal motivation going forward to keep working towards their goals and their dreams in their life. And I, I, I trust that our stories are what will hit people the most. We can hear all the stories we want about people that are making millions and billions of dollars and all the things. It's not relatable because we're not there yet. Mm. Right. And so mm. I want to encourage my audience with the real life raw behind the scenes. This was what I really struggled with. This is how I, you know, made it through that or whatever it was that supported you to keep growing and keep moving forward. So that's a lot of why I ask what your story is and, and how you get to where you are. So. Okay. Sounds good. Do you have any questions or anything you want to touch on before we actually get started into everything? I would like to confirm that your podcast is walking with you in life, faith, and business. That is correct. Perfect. Okay. And then on YouTube, it's the same. It'll be walking with you. Um, it's the walking with you thought process, all of the, you know, community, everything on my, um, on my channel. So it'll be the same context there as well. Okay. That so, and I'll make good. sure that you get the links and everything to that um, before we launch everything. Okay. Awesome. All righty. Uh, let me check real quick before I get things rolling. Uh, my dog, one of our dogs is in my office. This is the first time he's been in here today. Usually he's in here with me all day. So he may bark. If he hears a noise, he's going to do it. So I'm <laughs> just forewarning you. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. 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 I love all everybody's. I love when people are so explanatory in their questions that I ask because some people tell me nothing. And I'm like, I have no idea what to say to you. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what to ask you. You didn't tell me anything. Uh, so this is great. This is great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get moving and we can jump right into our conversation. Okay. All right. You ready? Ready to go. Welcome to another podcast episode. I'm your host, Dina Adams, and today we are talking with Ann Visser, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation because we hear so often about John Maxwell and all of these places, and we hear what people do for a living, yet we don't truly hear the person behind all the work and all the greatness that is happening. And so today, when we hear from Anne, we're going to get to hear about her story, her journey, her heart, and her passion behind everything that she does and how she serves and helps people. And I'm looking forward to learning from Anne today as well. So Anne, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dina, for the invitation to be here on your podcast, Walking With You in Life, Faith, and Business. I'm really honored to meet you and to share with you on the podcast today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. So if you would please go ahead and just do an introduction for us so we know who you are, what you do, how you help people, and then we'll get into your story a little bit. Sure. So my name is Ann Visser. And I have been equipping individuals and organizations for over 20 years now to help them communicate in a way that aligns with their values as a, as a certified John Maxwell coach, speaker, and trainer with For Better Forever, which I co-founded with my beloved husband, Malus. And so I train, I teach, I coach in areas of communication, leadership, mindset, personal growth, but especially relationships. My heart is for relationship. And so for over 20 years, I've been working with couples, teaching them to communicate and conflict in ways that help bring them closer together 
and I've been teaching young people and students. I have a course that's been written by Dr. John Van Epp. It's called How to Avoid Falling for a Jerk. I just love this program. We're in the middle of of this program right now and it's just so exciting this is my first time offering it online I usually do it live so I'm very excited to have that opportunity and um, I had the opportunity to teach values-based leadership skills to junior high students in Paraguay with John Maxwell himself that was very that was just a, a trip of a lifetime and I have taught and trained addicts in recovery in our local jail and in a recovery home for addicts to help them change from the inside out to support their sobriety and their growth. And I also have a membership for Christian women, and it's called the Sisterhood Journey Membership. And that focuses on the four lanes of communication. We talk about God talk, self talk. Right now we're talking about uh, people talk and pivotal conversations. And then we have the leadership talk lane. And fun fact, Dina, Malis and I have been married for 42 years we have five children, and I have 11 amazing grandchildren. <laughs> wow. Oh, my gosh. 40 years. That's incredible. My husband, you know, and this is right up my alley. I am. I love self-discovery. I love digging in, but the way I like to say it is to the darkest, deepest parts of your soul to get in, find the root, and start to recover and heal from the inside out because our relationship with ourself to me is the most important one in our lives. And I know a lot of people, especially people of faith will say, well, what about your relationship with God? And I say, well, if my relationship is not good with my father figure or with authority or with, you know, things like that, I will struggle with my relationship with God as that father figure in my faith. And so I truly believe getting into that rawness inside of ourselves, although terrifying as it may be sometimes, it's the best thing you can do for yourself. And my husband and I have been married for 21 years, and we have five adult children, no grandchildren um, yet. And I just, I love hearing 40 years, yet what's more important than the time is the quality because mm -hmm. you can be in a relationship for a very very long time and it can be not great at all right and and there's so much around um what it takes to not only keep a marriage together but what it takes to keep it growing moving forward and that can be a challenge for so many people. And so I just love hearing that. Um, I'd love for you to start off with, because you talked about so many things that you do <laughs> with couples and women and, and recovery and children and all of the things, I would love to hear what brought you, like, I'd like to hear your story. What brought you into the space that you said, I'm going to be a John Maxwell coach. I'm going to come into, I'm going to move forward, helping couples to heal and strengthen those relationships to help students grow and, and connect with themselves to help addicts overcome and recover. Like, what is it that was that maybe not all of us have a defining moment. It just is kind of an evolution. So what was yours? Was it an evolution? Was it a one moment where you said, okay, this is what I have to do. Were you going through a journey? Like, tell us a bit about that background before you came into being a John Maxwell coach. It was absolutely one moment. <sighs> and it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about equipping others to have better relationships. Um, I met my husband when I was 15 and I shamelessly chased him. <laughs> I just wanted a date, Dina. Just give me the date. I just want a date. And um, I, I was writing him notes in his desk, leaving them there and asking him questions. He was different. And I was very curious about this difference in him. So he wasn't out uh, drinking on the weekends. He was a leader within our school. He mm -hmm. was a leader on the photography class 
club and I wanted to know who is this guy? What is about him that's, uh, and I found it very attractive, this, this courage and drive that he had. And so I did get my date and three years later we married. And I still remember the photographer saying to us, he said, I've never seen a couple look at each other the way the two of you look at each other. And it was because we were so crazy in love. We were just so crazy in love. And then we, I was pregnant one month after we were married and very, very sick. And then we had five children in six years. Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. I don't know six what the years. big rush was. <laughs> 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 and my husband is a farmer and he's, he's still farming and he was working long hours. I was adjusting to being a farmer's wife and the long hours and being a single mother and mm -hmm. having many children. So there were these external pressures that were pressing in on our marriage. And then we have had internal pressures. And one of those internal pressures was just the lack of skills. My goodness. I uh -huh. did not know. I didn't know how to communicate what was going on inside of me. I didn't even recognize what was happening inside of me to be able to communicate what was happening. And so we were not fighting well. And we were, in fact, avoiding conflict, which we later found out that that's detrimental to relationships. And so we were avoiding having these really important conversations that we needed to have in order to know and understand each other better. And so this creeping separateness, this emotional distance crept into this very in love marriage. And for heaven's sakes, I just thought it was going to happen. Like, doesn't love just happen? Do we yeah. really have to work at it? Yes. Well, you think, okay, I'm in love with this person. It's just always going to be that way. And if you're not, then unfortunately, the current societal thing is, well, you can just get divorced. Mm -hmm. If it's not working. But I don't think we realize that it's not about it always being blissful. There's not a marriage is not going to be happily ever after. Like, happily ever after to me is the fact that my husband and I will argue because that means we're communicating to some degree or working through something. We might have some heated conversations. Everything's not perfect. And then we still are in love with each other. That's a happily ever after to me. But most people in the way society breathes it into us anymore. It's, it's as fleeting as unfortunately a one night stand anymore that there is no the sanctity of marriage is no longer instilled in our children or you know our loved ones around the importance of the vows that we take and even if those vows are broken the potential for healing and, and moving forward is still an opportunity. Every time something bad happens doesn't mean you have to walk away. Mm -hmm. So to hear you yes. talk about the struggles and that you couldn't communicate effectively and that you avoided conflict for some time and that, that not fighting well, people think fighting is a bad thing, but sometimes you just have to know how to do it <laughs> to get a resolution and to get to the other side, right? So I love that you're talking about those things because a lot of people, and I'm hopeful that people listening to this will hear, oh, that's that's normal. Like we can do that, but <laughs> it's not as bad as we made it out to be. No, it's not. <laughs> Right. And so then, so then we had this separateness, this emotional mm -hmm. distance that we didn't like, that we knew we could do it differently and better, but we didn't know how to get back to that place. And so I was at the end of my rope on this particular night. We were on a date. We were in our farm truck outside our favorite restaurant. And I looked at him and I said, um, I, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean you can't do this anymore? And I said, I can't do marriage like this anymore. I said, we just keep hurting each other. We don't ever resolve anything um, because we don't fight very well. And when we do, we just, we were letting things build up and build up and build up until somebody would explode. And that's not mm -hmm. a good way to fight. Mm -hmm. And so, but as I poured out how I was feeling and what was going on inside of me, he, something touched his heart in a way that I hadn't been able to before. And then for the first time in a very long time, he shared his heart with me. 
And we said, okay, we decided when we got married that if we needed help, we would go for help. This is the moment. Let's get the help that we need in order to get back to being better together again. And so that next day I went to my mother-in-law's because she had a whole wall full of self-help books. And I pulled Dr. Gary Smalley's book from her library that said, uh, making love last forever. I thought that sounds good. I have no idea who this guy is, but we need help. So let's, I'm desperate. <laughs> we devoured that, but we not only read it, we applied what we were learning and some of the lessons that he taught us, they stay with me today. They stay with us today. Conflict is the doorway to intimacy. So the way that we conflict, just as you were talking about the way that we conflict can actually bring us closer together instead of further apart. We were terrified of conflict. We didn't want to, in fact, when we read that, we both like threw the book down and said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were desperate. So we said, okay, teach us, mm -hmm. teach us how to fight. And so then he taught us there are different levels to communication. And we were not communicating at a deep level at all because we were afraid of being vulnerable with each other. But what mm -hmm. happens then is we didn't stay in the know with each other to really know each other's heart and understand each other. Well, as we started to apply these lessons we were learning, we started to fall in love again. Mm -hmm. And we found our way back to each other again. Now, it wasn't, it, it was a choice and then it was a journey. And so I don't want to give your listeners um, the, the opinion that it was easy. It was hard. And we had some things from the past to work through and to deal with. But as we started to get new hope and started to love one another again in a better way, um, we looked at each other and we said, we can't keep this to ourselves. We have to share this with other people because there must be other people like us who are you know, they're a difficult couple and they're lacking the skills that they need in order to be better together. And so we started to host weekends and this is how, this is how we get started, Dina. We started to host weekends and we brought experts in to share their expertise on how to have better relationships. And then eventually we started to lead our own classes and we would partner with other churches and lead classes within their churches and invite their people in to learn how to be better together. And that's how For Better Forever was born. And it was a nonprofit for many, many years uh, where we would just give it away. And um, we learned very quickly, though, that if people don't invest in themselves, they take advantage. Yes. And they, they take advantage of what is being offered. And so, for example, uh, we had a wonderful doctor in our community who allowed us to meet in his, who blessed us to meet in his office. So it was very professional. Um, but we would be sitting outside on a cold winter's night waiting for a couple to show up and no call, no message. And uh, we, I would call them and say, are you coming? Oh, we forgot. It was like, okay. We, <laughs> I looked at my husband and said, you know, we could be on a date right now. <laughs> we could be, you know, investing in our marriage. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so then we started to charge a little bit uh, for meeting together with people. And immediately they started to show up. I think it's really important to be to invest in ourselves, uh, to really value the work that we're doing and to value the work that other people are pouring into us. I would not be where I am today without the people who have poured into my life and our life and our marriage and our family. I oh, I just love your story. And I, I want to go back to one of the things you said where you said it was a choice and then a journey. And so often it's so easy to just give up when it gets hard. And when our kids were little, the whole participation award thing came into play and it drove me bonkers. I think that was such a load of crap. I was like, you can commend your children for participating. They don't need an award for living life in that way, right? We need to teach them that you have to put in the work if you want to win, if you want to get better, if you want to grow, like it's not about getting a participation award, right? If you're just, if you're just playing a game because you just want to play the game because you enjoy it, that's fine. You're participating and what your reward is, is being a part of that experience. Mm -hmm. And I think, after that, as, as our kids have grown and, I, and then we've seen people and their relationships and society grow 
through these past 28 years of having kids, one of my biggest frustrations is the lack of accountability in other people, in, in people in general. And they believe that they don't have to be accountable and they get upset for other people wanting them to be responsible for themselves and their actions and their choices. And so when it comes into marriage and parenthood and, and leading others, people get offended so easily because they should just be, it should just be how it is and it's how I want it. And so it's got to be okay because I don't want to hold that responsibility. But a lot of it's because they don't know how. They were never taught how to honor their responsibility and not get offended when someone else says, hey, this isn't okay. Instead of going, oh, well, what's not okay with it? How do we fix it? How do we make it better? It's how dare you get have a problem with me in any way? And we brought that into our marriages in such a big way that there's no understanding of how to resolve conflict, how to hold each other accountable, and how to honor our vows. Because one of the things for me in honoring my husband, it's to hold him to who he says he's going to be. And when he, in his vow to love and cherish me, it is to take care of me in the way that fulfills me and helps me be better, not to just act like everything I do is okay and it's all fine because it's not. <laughs> and so we don't learn how to step out of that feeling that, oh my God, it's the worst thing ever that someone just said they have a problem with me. And we, as we bring that into our marriages, even if it doesn't happen often, but you have those moments that you're like, I, this just sucks. This is so hard. I don't even know why I'm doing this anymore. And it doesn't matter how many years you've been married. When things get hard and you don't have the skill set or the tools in place to support you through it, it can feel that way. So I'd love for you to share, like, in your marriage, when you're talking about going from a choice and then a journey, and and there's a, like, it takes time. It's not an overnight thing. It's not even a couple of months thing. It can be months or over a year or more as people are learning to develop these skills. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about what that was like for you and your husband going through that and then um, being able to come to this other side where, oh, we're, we're, f we're figuring it out again. <laughs> The journey looked like this, so um, a, a little bit of hope and then really deep back into it again, and then um, coming up again to a little bit of hope and then falling back down again really deep. But then those spaces grew further and further apart, and we didn't go down as far as we would in the beginning, and then they would get then they started to get really far apart and then we would fall really deep again it was be like it was like oh no I thought we dealt with this already I'm like mm -hmm. how are we here again but I think growth is so much like that and I think it's important to have that expectation that it's okay and I like to think of it as God's dealing with another layer of that for me. It's, it's, and so I'm going to put opportunity in air quotes. So when I when I fall down that bad again, it's an opportunity to grow again. He's working on something deep, deeper inside of me that he hasn't done before. And so that's what that growth journey looked like. It was messy. It was hard at times. And yet it was hopeful at other times. Um, because we had made a commitment when we got married, we said we're going to get the help that we need if we need help. We should have said when. I think all <laughs> couples need help at some point in time. And now that's what I tell my pre-married couples when I work with them. I say, it's not if, it's when. And when you run into trouble sooner than later, come for help. Don't let it build up until it's really big like we did. And so learn from my mistakes. <laughs> But that journey was so incredibly good because it made me go within to grow myself. It put both of us on a personal growth journey, which is interesting, to get better ourselves. But then it put us on 
a marital journey, a partnership to walk together through it, helping each other to get better. And so for me, I am a recovering, my name is Ann Visser. I'm a recovering people pleaser. <laughs> You're my people. Okay. I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Conflict avoider, peace lover. And so mm -hmm. I had to learn how to be okay with saying hard things, even though my husband might not like it or he might take offense to it. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to be okay with him, his uncomfortable emotions because he didn't like what I was saying. I had to learn how to even understand what was going on inside of me. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? What is it that I really want? I didn't know. In the beginning, I couldn't answer those questions except that I knew that I wanted this marriage. And mm. so and so it was it's it's impossible to express that to somebody else if you don't know what's going on inside of you. And so I had to learn those skills and I thought it was something that should come naturally. Like shouldn't I just be able to do this? It's a skill. It's a skill to be able to identify feelings and thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's a skill then to be able to communicate those feelings and thoughts and to be able to say what it is what you want with grace, right? We we can still yes. disagree and still be still like each other. It's okay. And so there were so many skills that we had to learn. We learned from Dr. Smalley that conflict is the doorway to intimacy so that when we conflict, into me you see. And so I then I realized as we were conflicting, I realized, wait a minute, I not only see into you, but I see deeper into me too. That's really powerful to be able to understand myself in better and deeper ways. And so it was that one pivotal conversation that we had inside our truck, outside our favorite restaurant that changed the trajectory of my life, of our marriage and, and of our work together, um, which, it, which just was so, uh, it was, it's so wonderful to have him in the room when he, he is, um, when he is in the room. Now, uh, in the last four years, I have, he decided, we were sitting on a beach in Mexico and we were reading The One Thing by Gary Keller. And he recognized that he needed, he was divided between coaching and farming. And he recognized that he needed to return to farming wholeheartedly in order to make the for, farm more sustainable and to help it to thrive. And so at that time he pulled away from coaching and I had to then make a choice to go on my own and make it a business as well. And so mm -hmm. then I invited my daughter who was in between jobs. I said, come work for me, digital expert. <laughs> <laughs> And so she um, started to work for me, I believe it was four years ago. And so we've been together working at this business and building it online as we go. And that is certainly challenging. I am not going to lie about that, Dina. That is hard work. It is and, challenging uh, to go online, especially when you've been offline for so long and doing this in your community and locally and and traveling to do the things what you need that you need to do. And so, you know, first I want to share, like, I, I just want to kind of touch on a couple of things that you mentioned real quick was the fact that he read that book and said, I have to step out. That can be such a challenging thing because it's not always you know, it's not common for a lot of entrepreneurs to be working with their spouses, but they will find that they have to step out of something or they have to shift into a new job or there's something really big that they have to make a shift. And when they come, your spouse comes to you and says, this has to change. I have to do this. One of the things I have found and I've heard from so many people over the years is my spouse doesn't support me. My spouse doesn't support, and I've heard it from men and women alike. There is no one or the other. It's across the board that my spouse doesn't get it. They don't support me. And it's not just in making those big changes. It's maybe in the fact that 
you're ready to grow and change, but your spouse isn't at that place and doesn't want to learn the skills and doesn't want to do all of that stuff. So I'd love mm -hmm. it if you could speak just for a moment on maybe giving some support to listeners who are struggling with their spouse may not be supportive of the shift that they're making in their business or from one business to another. And, and it might even be able to tie into where in the marriage, you know that something needs to change and you know you need to learn skills and you need to get support and help for it to be better, but the spouse is disinterested or they say they want to do it and they show up, but they don't do the work. So how do you support mm -hmm. them? Like what's one thing that they could do right now to, to help with that type of a conversation in their marriage? Mm -hmm. I say, learn the skills of, first of all, I, I mindset, when one person works on a marriage, it changes the dance. It changes the steps. They are changing their steps. It makes, it creates a situation where the other person needs to change their steps in some way. And I say that when one person works on the marriage alone, it can help. It can help you know where you are and give you some definition around where you are, um, especially when you do it with a good heart. I mean, intention matters, right? Motivation matters. Uh -huh. And if I'm doing it to get back at you and to say there I was right, that's not a great intention or a great motive. But if I'm doing it because I'm curious and I know what is working, what I'm doing right now is not working. I know I need to do something different. I say, let's experiment and let's shift it up a little bit and let's see. So maybe she's communicating yak, 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 right? A lot of words. And he is just tuning her out. <laughs> dial it down. Let's experiment with that. What happens when you dial it down? Does he kind of like wonder where you are, like what's happening, like haven't heard from you, what's going on? Is he, does that pique his curiosity? If what you're doing right now isn't working, try something different with a good heart and a good intention. Yeah. Then I want to encourage your people to learn the skills of pivotal conversation. Learn the ability, first, number one is to be able to check emotions. Preparation is key. We have these conversations multiple times. These conversations that are really big and matter, we had them multiple times. So we know it's going to come up again, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going, it may catch us by surprise, but if we prepare for it, we're going to be ready for it. And so I say, learn the skill, learn to check your emotions, learn to check your motives. So those questions that I had to learn how to answer, I encourage my people to journal those questions out. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What is really troubling you about this situation right here? That question may surprise you. It may surprise you about what's really troubling you. Like maybe what's really troubling you is that you go right to the, you go right to the end and you say, I'm afraid we're going to get a divorce. That's different than, uh, I'm afraid that we are just not going to be able to resolve this problem. And I don't don't know if your people are like me, but sometimes I go to that very end and think the worst instead of just kind of backing it up and, and taking it a step by step. So that question, what is troubling and really important? And then the last question is, what is it that I really, really want? And to do that heart check, so to speak, to do that, what is my motive here for having this conversation? Because our motives are kind of sneaky. They're slippery. Mm -hmm. And so maybe my motive is that I want my way and I'm going to fight to the death to get it, but there's no way I'm going to tell you that or even admit that to myself because I know if I'm a person of faith, I know that that's not the greatest motive to have, right? And so they're so stinking slippery. It's really important to understand what is my motive here so that we can go into the conversation with a good heart um, and know that regardless of the outcome, I came with my best, <laughs> And so when we can do that heart check, it's easier in the middle of the conversation to manage my emotions because emotions can so easily derail a good conversation. Mm. When, um, when we get flooded and we're triggered, it can be then so hard to move forward in the conversation. And so this is one way to help us when we prepare for a pivotal conversation, this is a great way to get us ready to communicate more effectively, to do something different because what we're doing already is not working. I love what you say about prepare for the conversation. 
you know, instead of it being trying to have this, and, and I am guilty of this, I am a talker, I'm a verbal processor, and I just want to, I just want to resolve it then and just hash it all out. And my husband is an internal processor. It takes him time to process through his thoughts and his feelings and be very intentional about what that looks like. And so you can imagine we have a bit of a challenge on our hands when it comes to conflict. And so often the fact that I want to go right to the end and it's because something was triggered and I get emotional and I just want to dive in and fix it. And he's like, what's happening? And then I get upset because he's not all in that conversation with me and he's tuning out because he's so overwhelmed with me coming at it with the energy that I do and the way I do. And he's like, I can't even deal with this crazy lady right now. (laughs) Mm. Not because he doesn't care and not because it's not important to him, but because I didn't, I don't always use my skills to hold my thoughts when something is triggered to check my emotions and be like, is this really the time to even say anything? Is this just me being triggered when it's really not the, like, I don't take that time to evaluate and utilize my skills. And when that happens, he checks out, I go nuts and I'm like, you know, all the things. And he's just like, can you please just stop? And he gets so mad. And it's not because he's mad. I'm, I've recognized it's because he's overwhelmed and so feels so bombarded and attacked by the way I approach it. And so em- when we come at things with our emotions, we have lost all logic. <laughs> yes. Right? And it, it's yes. not a good situation. And, and mm-hmm. I love that you share that because... I think we also have to realize when you talk about that growth and how those valleys are farther and farther apart, it's it's because we're utilizing the skills and we're getting better and we're growing. You don't go to school and learn one basic level and that's it. Once you finish the basic level, you go to the next. And it's really hard at the beginning until you learn it and the hard parts get farther and farther apart. And then you go to that next level. And that's how God cultivates us. That's how he works in our spirit. That's how he works to develop us into who he's called us to become. Because we're not meant to just be, we are meant to become constantly. And, and I just love some of the points that you're making with the motive and preparing for those pivotal, pivotal conversations and, and really taking inventory of ourselves before we start talking. Because listening, giving my husband space to talk and be who he is without telling him all the problems I have with that, that's a challenge for me because I'm a fixer. I'm, I'm the, I'm, you know, and I, I'm a self-discovery coach and I do all this mindset stuff. So I just want to, I just want to tell him everything that he can do to make it better instead of giving him space to just be and share his feelings. And that in itself, just trying to be a fixer can really create that distance in those, in a relationship because the other person just wants you to shut your mouth and, and hold space for them and just be there. And sometimes if that's not our natural instinct, it can, it, it can really be challenging when you have such different personalities in a marriage. It really is. A, it is another skill to learn how to hold back and be okay internally, mm-hmm. because when you've got a lot to say, it's like your whole being is vibrating. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I loved how you talked about giving him space, because if, if you're talking at a one to 10, and let's say that there's a, there's a one to 10 space in the relationship and you're talking at a one to eight, then there's only 2% left for him. Yeah. And so I love how you're talking about giving him space and you're talking about like, if you dial it back a little bit and you think about, let's give you more space because when we are slow processors, we need space to think. Otherwise we get lost and overwhelmed in emotions. And so when you give him that more space, he then has 
more ability to be able to think mm-hmm. through what's happening inside of him and what's going on so that he can then share that with you. Yeah, it's a challenging skill for sure. It's something I'm still working on and learning and I have to be like, oh, I'm so sorry, I did it again. And, you know, I think that's another piece of of a relationship is the being able to take responsibility for yourself even when you don't want to but you know you were wrong and having to say I'm sorry and I apologize because to me I'm sorry means I'm going to do better Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. I apologize for how I treated you or how I acted or how I reacted or whatever my part was and I am sorry so I will work on doing dot 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 next time and and just giving that space to not just use I'm sorry as a blanket statement I'm sorry just to make it better because it doesn't really make it better that's always been a big thing for me is I'm sorry I'm going to do better and I I am always open to feedback and constructive criticism and all of that because I didn't used to be and so I've made that a very big part of who I am and so I'll be like what would have made it better for you I have a bad I have bad timing, so I'll ask in the in the middle of the whole thing. Yep. But it's like I have to come back later and be like, okay, what what was it about that situation that what I did caused this frustration? I'm always trying to figure it out, right? And so I go and ask, and he's like, no, like that's not the way he thinks, right? And so I don't get the feedback I'm looking for, so I feel like I don't know how to do better. But but what I learned is. The way I do better is I do look into scripture. I do look into reading books that will support me and learn new skills and test those out because I can't always look to him most of the time to tell me what I can do better because that's not his job. He's not a therapist. He's not a coach. He's not, he's not that person. And I think too often we put that responsibility of our spouse in that role that they're never meant to be that role Mm -hmm. and so that's been something i've had to learn over the last i've probably learned that in the last like six months that oh that's not for him to answer and i keep asking and i've got to stop asking that question because he he doesn't know i gotta go to somebody who that's their expertise Mm -hmm. and learn here's the situation what am i doing that's creating this issue and I can't seem to figure it out what are my blind spots right so Mm. yeah yeah um I I just wanted to back it up because you mentioned a skill earlier there that's a really important skill and it's the skill of translation so you mentioned that when he gets overwhelmed and he kind of walks away or he's not participating in the conversation you said it's not that he doesn't care yeah that's a really important translation because often we do go to that place of he just doesn't care. And that's a whole different Mm -hmm. translation than he just doesn't have the skills that he needs in order to, um, in order to be able to communicate right now, or he's overwhelmed is how you put it. He's overwhelmed right now with emotions. And that's a really good translation to be able to come to because the way that we translate those disagreements that we have really do matter. Um, because if I think that if my thought is every time we argue or disagree, he doesn't care, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about us. Then that's a very different, it's a toxic translation and it's not going to be a helpful translation to help us get back on on track. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something we deal with a lot in our relationships in general, that if we're arguing with someone, if we're having a conflict then the other person doesn't care. But then what does that say about me? Because I'm part of this conflict and issue too. And it's like, well, if I still, I care enough to fight through it, right? I care enough to fight for it. I care enough to go to battle for it. Then it means something to me. But then you Mm -hmm. talked about motive. Mm -hmm. And there's that thing. I tell you, I hear this all the time. Do you want to be right? Or do you want a healthy marriage? I'm like, shut that. No, no, I don't like that, right? Because it's convicting and it makes it hard for us to be like, oh, it's not always about being right. To me, it's been more about being heard and am I hearing him? 
Am I listening as much as I want to be heard? Right? Do I hear him when he talks? Am I listening? And that's a skill that we have to develop. There's so many skills we have to develop that we don't learn growing up anymore that people used to have, or they just didn't teach and you just didn't talk. Right. <laughs> and so now we have people like you who can come in and say, okay, here's the skill that's going to support you in this space to help you grow and, and make this better. And, and to have that and have access to that, I think is, a, is priceless these days because, and a lot of times we don't even know that that's an option. We don't know it's needed. All we hear is couples therapy or we have to go to therapy, but I'll tell you, everybody should be in therapy. I think we all need that person that can look from the outside in and help mm -hmm. us hold ourselves accountable, mm -hmm. not because, I mean, it's just like with medicine, right? You should be going into your providers to help you keep yourself healthy, not only at the aftermath of all the disaster. And I mm -hmm. think if we would utilize therapy and coaching and all of those things that are, as a preventive measure, as opposed to destruction recovery, <laughs> Yes. We would have the skills that we need to work through that. So I just, I love what you do. I love how you articulate so many things and are able to, to bring that hope into it, that it's, just, these are skills we have to learn and it helps us have grace with ourselves mm -hmm. that, oh, we all need this. None of us learned this in school. We didn't learn, uh, we did not learn, a lot of us did not learn this by watching our parents. Because <laughs> our parents didn't know either most of the time, <laughs> right? Not for most of us anyway. No, that's right. Our parents didn't know. And I think it should be mandatory. Listen, these are, these are transferable skills that when we learn them around the dinner table as a family, when we learn how to conflict, when we learn how to communicate more effectively, when we learn to be curious about each other, I love that word mm -hmm. curiosity in relationship. And it can help us get better when we're curious with one another kindly. Um, when we learn those skills around the dinner table, those skills are transferable to everything else that we do, whether we're coaching on a sports team or whether we're the head of an organization or participating in an organization or whether we're at work and working with a team. Those, the skills of being able to listen, being able to communicate effectively, being able to work together and cooperate on a team, being able to disagree mm -hmm. and not be so disagreeable that you can't work together. <laughs> right. Those are all transferable skills that when we learn them at home, when we learn them in our, in, in our family, we can take those out into the world. And so parents turn off the TV and put the phones down and sit and have dinner together and talk with your kids and hear from your kids and share with your kids how to communicate and how to connect in a way that is so impactful that when they go out into the world, they know they are steps ahead of their, um, of their peers because they know how to communicate effectively in order to connect with people, to care about people. Yes. And I think even I would take that a whole nother step and say, parents, <laughs> I wish I would have learned this when my kids were younger because our conversations around the dinner table would have been different. There are skills that we could have taught our kids better that we didn't know. So we didn't know how to teach them. So they learned the dysfunction that we had. And so dinner around the dinner table has not become something we enjoy because we don't communicate effectively as a family because we never knew how. So learning those skills as a parent and then being able to come together with your kids and, and being open and say, you know what, I'm learning how to do this and I want to help you learn too. not come at it as I know all this because I learned it and now I'm going to teach them and they're going to have to do it this way, right? It's a really allowing them to also test out those skills and teach them those skills because we can learn from them. There's so much we can learn from our kids because there's a lot of things that they don't bring into it that we do because they don't have a lot of the things that we've already been through. And so I think it's just a great opportunity to learn our skills, bring that into our marriages and our families and our relationships and our businesses and, and all of the things. So thank you, Anne, so much for this incredible 
incredible conversation. I know people got so much out of this. I was taking notes as well while we were talking. There were things I just wanted to make sure I remembered so I can go back and listen later. Um, because I think they're so important. You, you taught us already just in this space so many things to consider and to, and to think about when we're going into our relationships in every day. So thank you for being here. You're so welcome, Dina. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I do have a free gift. Can I share that with your people? Yes, I was going to, but you please share that. <laughs> okay. Go, that was, yes, please well, do. Yeah, so we've been talking about pivotal conversations, and maybe someone in your audience is thinking about that next pivotal conversation that they know that they've been putting off, but they want to have. And so we have a seven-day challenge that will help you get ready to start that next pivotal conversation. And so each day we send out a short video with a simple action step for you to take that day to prepare step-by-step -step for your next pivotal conversation so that it goes in a way that actually helps bring you closer together rather than pulling you through they're apart. So you can pick that seven day challenge up at uh, for better forever. That's the numerical number for better forever.com forward slash challenge. That is fantastic. I know that people will be able to jump on that. You can find Anne's links and how to connect with her in the comments below this podcast. Um, also, any if you are interested in continuing this conversation, you guys can join us over in the Facebook community as well. Um, anytime we have these amazing conversations, I want this community to be able to continue that conversation, share your aha moments. What did you get out of this? Um, follow Anne, get connected with her, and share how she's been able, just from this one conversation, to help you take another step in these pivotal conversations in your life. So thank you all for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Anne, so much. This was amazing. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. I love these, these raw conversations where we can just really get into what really happens in life. And because I'm such a very transparent person and I've done so much work in myself, I can have some of these conversations where, you know, I can share the hard things that I actually go through because I want people to hear that, yeah, you can do all this work and it's still, there's still challenges there for us to work on and to work through. And so I'm really hopeful that many people will jump into your community and, and get your challenge and learn how to, how to support themselves and, and start growing. I, I just think yes. it's incredible what you guys do. Thank you, Dina. You know, he, um, I said to him not long ago, we were laying in bed together and I said, um, I'm so glad you didn't give up on us when mm. we went through the desert and because now it's so sweet, Dina. And I'm just so grateful that the commitment that he had to our marriage that we had, that, that it, we hung in there because it was stinking hard, yeah. um, but now it's really sweet. And and so we get to kind of do it again. It's kind of like a second marriage in a way. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. It, it's one of those things like, you know, when you talked about just now saying that he was so committed, like he was so in, right? He was so willing. And early in our marriage, I had um, a relationship with someone else and it was a very emotional relationship. And when it started to turn physical, I kind of freaked out and was like, oh, this is an awakening that, you know, I'm still married. And even though right now I, I, I hate my husband at the moment, like I was just, mm. I, we were so, we just couldn't really stand each other's presence. Um, it was a moment that was like, oh God, I, I can't, I, I can't, I shouldn't be doing this. This isn't where it's supposed to go. It doesn't change the fact that I was unfaithful to my husband. It doesn't change the fact that I was emotionally connecting with another person and I allowed this to happen. And what was interesting was my husband was watching it unfold and he was telling me like, this guy really wants to be more than your friend. I was like, you are crazy. You're just being whatever. Like I was so not willing to hear him. And so when I came to him and told him what had happened, his first words were, I forgive you. And I, wow. I've never, I never grasped how someone could love me because I was a very broken person. And mm -hmm. I 
never believed that it would let that he'd want to stay with me anyway I figured he'd get sick of me and whatever and so the early years into I don't know three and a half years into our marriage all this stuff started transpiring we started having a lot of problems and and he said that to me and I lost it I was just in tears and I still hadn't told him everything that had happened and so seven years later when I he he had he's like something just you're just not telling me everything I know it and so when I finished telling him everything the trust was completely gone, Mm. right? So seven years later, that's 10 years into our marriage. Here we are 21 years, 22 years into our relationship. There's still that broken trust that makes it very challenging in our relationship that I'm always trying to figure out, well, how do I, how do I fix this, Mm -hmm. right? How do I, do things differently but so much of it was me trying to control how it got better Mm -hmm. I never really sat and gave him space without criticizing Mm -hmm. and without bringing up our problems and all that stuff it took me a long time to recognize that I was still a very big part of our problems because I wasn't giving him room Mm. and he said something to me one day and he says it just every time you say things to me makes me feel like you're beating me down and I was like whoa that's not what I'm Mm. trying to do at all and that's not what I thought I was saying yeah and the fact that he could say that to me and I could be like whoa I what if like I have to reflect on what I mean what's even coming out of my mouth I can't believe that you feel that way. I've been trying to be supportive and, and help us move forward and grow. And so it's perspective too, yeah. right? Of, of how we see things. And that made a world of difference. Like until you're open to seeing your own flaws and your mm-hmm. own contribution to the issues, the other person is always going to feel like you're just you know, you're just never going to have that communication. But for him to, him to feel like he could tell me that was like, oh, this is a breakthrough because he was able to tell me something that he would have never told me before out of fear of it causing an argument. Right. And yeah. so it's it's learning those skills and keeping at practicing and yeah. practicing. Practicing makes progress. It doesn't make perfect. So the things that you help your clients, I'm like, gosh, I needed you like 20 years ago. (laughs) Years ago, we were going through all these things because we, unless you hear about it, you don't know about it. So I'm so honored to have you in, in my community now and be able to share you with other people who truly need that support and that guidance in those relationships so it can help them flourish. So I'm so grateful and honored to have had you here on the podcast and to have gotten to really spend this time with you and share you with everybody. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to meet you. And thank you for sharing your story with me as well and trusting me with that. And I appreciate that. I, it's um, to me, it's such a gift when people share their stories with me. So I appreciate that. You're so welcome. Well, you take care. We will be in touch. I'll be getting you an email with, um, the release date of the podcast and um, anything else that's going to go with that for sharing it out on social media and everything. And when do you expect that will happen, Dina? Um, So all of the podcasts I'm recording right now will be launching starting January. Okay. So um, you'll be in that first grouping in January. Okay. That sounds great. Um, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Would you mind uh, sending me a review on my Facebook business page and um, LinkedIn as well? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to go ahead and email those links over yep. to me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, just from this conversation alone, there's so much value to offer and, and, and it's so specific, but it's still on like so many people need it. I would be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. And I would love to give you a review as well. Um, Where is the best place to do that? Absolutely. Um, Well, I'm learning about all of that right now because (laughs) Apple Podcasts is the only place that allows reviews that I have found. You can't leave a review on Spotify, which is my main platform. Um, And 
So I, I, I honestly don't even know. I think you could go just to my Facebook business page okay, and leave a review there. Um, just as a post that you are more than welcome to do that there. That would be great. Okay. Um, and I think that's in the signature line of my emails. I believe it is. Um, let me just double check that that Facebook one goes to my business page. Yes, it does. So um, it's facebook.com forward slash with Dina Adams is my Facebook page. And you can leave a comment there as well. That would be, okay. that probably be the best place because then I can share it wherever. And yes, yeah, you can take a screenshot. Until I learn how to do the whole review thing because that's all new to me. <laughs> 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 so... All, All right. right. Well, thank you so much. You take care and I will be in touch. Sounds good. Good to meet right. you. Bye. Bye.